once upon a time, down in Guadalajara, Mexico, a boy was born. As he grew, the boy took an interest in the arts, and with his father's Super 8 camera, he started to produce little short stories using action figures and potatoes. This passion blossomed into an obsession, channeled both into his education and his career. As a director, he created a plethora of short films, while also working on the Mexican show La Hora Macada. Hakuna Matata! On the side, he honed his skills as a special effects artist and formed his own effects company, Necropia. But all the while, the ambition to create bigger and better things loomed. He needed to achieve his childhood dreams and finally create that big first feature film. And so, in 1993, after years of hard work on what wound up being Mexico's highest budgeted film up to that point, the boy named Guillermo del Toro released his debut, Cronos. Time, time, time. See what's become of me. Kronos is a very assured film, especially for a feature debut, with a great attention for detail. Impressively, it already feels like what we know and understand a Del Toro picture to be. A blend of classic and modern horror, deeply rooted in historical lore, but also brimming with fairy tale qualities, with a peculiar interest in childhood wonderment, institutional villainy, clockworks, and creepy crawlies. The film also begins in typical fashion. Just like his later movies such as The Devil's Backbone and The Shape of Water, Kronos opens with a mini-story told via curious voiceover narration and gliding camera work. It immediately sets up a confounding mystery that will serve as the beating heart of this strange film, while also introducing audiences to the Kronos device named after the Greek god of time. In present-day Mexico, we meet our protagonist, Jesus, played by recurring Del Toro favourite Federico Lupi. Jesus runs his own antique shop, but otherwise lives a very subdued life, alongside his wife and young granddaughter. His days start to become exciting, as several shadowy figures start to take an interest in a certain statue among his wares. One of these men is played by Rodden Perlman, who of course also became another mainstay in the Del Toro playbook. Del Toro requested Perlman's involvement in the film by writing a personalised letter detailing all the aspects he admired in the actor. Perlman was naturally flattered and agreed to take part, despite not speaking any Spanish. No matter, this resulted in his character being rewritten as a bumbling American expat. Even in English, though, he was still victim to some unfortunate ADR. I love his nerve. I love his nerve. I love his nerve. I love his nerve. No matter, no matter. The pair got on like a haunted mansion on fire, with Perlman taking a huge pay cut when the budget later got way out of hand. Returning to the plot, Jesus himself is lured towards the item, as cockroaches spill out of its open eye cavity. Inside the statue, he and his granddaughter discover the Clonos device, which springs into action and embeds itself into his flesh. Relatable, similar thing happened to me with a binder clip. Basically, the Clonos device actually houses a disturbing old bug, whose sting can grant you eternal life. Downside is, it does so by turning you into a vampire. Jesus becomes addicted to the youthful vigour that the stabby stabby bug box provides him. So he shaves off his grandfatherly moustache, effectively shaving the years off his face and morphing him into Mexican Reese Efans. You know how these things go. He also discovers a need to drink human blood and all that. And after apparently dying, Jesus lives up to his namesake and resurrects as a creeping undead figure with marble skin. 
Bloody heck. Bloody neck. Anyway, there is also an evil, terminally ill business fiend trying to get his hands on the Clodos device to prolong his own existence. Jesus can't allow this guy, or his lackey nephew Ron Perlman, to succeed. Nor can he stomach his own suffering situation, leading to a beautifully bittersweet ending, with Del Toro proving for the first of many times that horror doesn't always just have to be blood and guts and nihilism. The serious themes are great, of course, but Guillermo del Toro also knows how to balance it out with some humour and levity. Perlman is a regular source of fun. Yes, Uncle. Get up here immediately! Motherfucking cocksucking son of a bitch asshole Bandero! I want to know what happened. You're right there. A subplot involving his obsession with plastic surgery results in a great recurring gag. The dark banter of the funeral workers is a welcome sidetrack from the main event, leading to the characters returning in the 2010 film, We Are What We Are. Overall, this is just a tribute to Del Toro's skills as a writer, director, and an effects artist. The story and the characters connect on both the horror and drama levels as required. The camera always seems to be in the right place. The tone is dead on. Everything was already in place so early on. A natural talent flew and flew. <laughs>